they were followers of Christ. Yeah. That's why Paul said, be followers of me. Watch the way I live. And be followers of me, even as I also am a follower of Christ. See, he qualified it. So if you see a noble person, a, a person that is exemplary, and you kind of sense you could follow them, or use them as an example of how you ought to live, their value is strictly determined by how much like Christ they are. And of course, you have to have some understanding of Christ. I understand and know that. Jesus is a standard because he is what's called in Scripture the express image of God. Amen. That is, he's a precise yes. likeness of God. Now, he's, a, he's a man, mm -hmm. a glorified man, not a man from Adam, a special man born from God. Amen. And the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in him, the Scripture says. That is, there's no trait of God that's not in Christ. Amen. There's no, uh, no aptitude that God has that his son doesn't have. No authority that God exercises that hasn't been given to the son. See, that's why he's a standard. He, it, everything's in him. Anything you're going to receive is in him. When it comes to what God expects of men, he's going to show you Christ who actually, here in the earth, lived it out. Yeah. Amen. And when it what comes to what God expects from men, he doesn't ask you to look to a law, not even his law. When it comes to standard, that's a moral standard. The law of God, Ten Commandments, that's the law of God, is, is a moral standard, a right and wrong standard. But Jesus is a is a precise image of God, that's what you've got to target. You target being as much like God as it is possible for a person of the earth to be. And just to show you it can be done, Jesus sent a man to earth and it was done in him. Oh, Jesus was asked to do things that you haven't been asked to do, like give his life for the sins of the world. You're <laughs> You're not asked to do that, see. But as far as living in the world is concerned, if you're 12 years old, when Jesus was 12, that's what a 12-year-old child should be like. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when he was two, we were given a sample, when he was two, we don't know much about him, but that's what a two-year-old should be like. When he was 30, he began his ministry. When he was 30, that's what a 30-year-old man should be like. <laughs> And when he died, that's how people should die, mm -hmm. committing their souls to God, so forth. So he's the, he's the perfect expression. Mm -hmm. The law was not intended to tell you how to live. Mm -hmm. yeah. The law was intended to show you that you don't have what it takes to live right. Mm -hmm. You've got to have some help, mm -hmm. and the help's going to come from Christ. Mm -hmm. and if you try and do the Ten Commandments on your own, you won't even get off first base. The summation of the first part of the law was love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. See, well, nobody's been able to do that except Jesus and those he empowers after they come into him. Yeah, and to love your neighbor as yourself, that's the summation of the second part of the law, is to have more concern for other people than for yourself. Amen. Well, that isn't exactly the standard of the world is you only go around once get all you can you know and that kind of stuff and you're the main person thinking yourself so that's the law teaches you that you you that's got to be what God says has to be done Amen. and finally if you take it seriously you find well I, I've got to have some help Lord on this Amen. and he demands that our affection, that's our desire, our preferences, our wants, 
be set on things above. Things above? Some people have no idea. What, what are things above? What are the clouds and the stars? No. <laughs> what he means is there's things in heaven that you can have, but you can't have them unless you want them. Yeah. Amen. And you can't have them unless you want them more than anything else. Yeah, that's kind of, Jesus is a standard. That's what he, that's how he was. There come a time when God said, you got to begin your ministry now, and he left the carpenter shop. That's it. He didn't do any more carpentry, not from the day he started working for, for the Lord in his ministry, if he, going about doing good and hitting all the oppressed to the devil, and he quit the carpenter shop. And our text has to do with living. Living up to a standard. Now, it's a serious text, and to be taken seriously. The, me the immediate context or surrounding this is the where he said that God that God forgave us, loved us, and forgave us for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the background of this text, and he's going to tell you that's how you. That's how you are to love, like Jesus loved. He forfeited his own rights in order to advantage the other people. Here's the text, the first two verses of Ephesians 5. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Amen. I admit that all of that has a strange sound if someone's not familiar with Scripture, like it sounds kind of peculiar. But it is peculiar. It is uh, rather unique. And here's one way you can tell, like, if you're growing in Christ or not, is if the things of God begin to make more sense to you, and you can see, oh, I, I see that. That's a sign you're growing or advancing, making advancement in the likeness of God. Be ye therefore... Now, I want to notice that these words, be ye. You be would be the modern way of saying it. He doesn't say, do ye, does he? He doesn't say, here's what to do. He says, here's what to be. No, oh, yeah. Being is different than doing. Hmm? You can take one of these little children here, and you can give them a hammer and a saw, and tell them to do a little carpentry work. And they, you won't be satisfied now with what they do. Why? Because they aren't. Because they aren't. They aren't carpenters. That's right. It's what they are. What they're. What they are doesn't measure up to these tools here. So he's going to tell you there's something you got to be. Don't don't even think about what you ought to do until you got it firmly fixed in your mind who you are. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. What you really are in Christ. What's happened? Now, some of the other versions translate this, be ye, do a very bad job of it, too, I might add, some of them. Therefore be, the therefore being in view of what I just got through saying, about uh, God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven us. In view of that, he's saying this, let it then be your desire, that's terrible. It's a basic Bible English Bible, that's, that's terrible. Become, oh, that, that's, it's a Young's literal translation, that's pretty good, become, be something, say, be something. So much you keep on, there's a Williams Bible, that's, that's terrible. Montgomery says, learn then, well, he's not talking about learning, he's talking about being, and that's, Contemporary English Bible says, and do. See, these are bad, bad translations. It's not just because we're picking on translations. This is not what God's saying. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
the major difference in many of the translations is some of them come from the standpoint of a, men, a law mentality, what you ought to do, what you should do, what you should want to do. And now, all, all those things are true. There are things you should do, and there are things you should want to do, but that's just not what he's talking about here. Being and doing, they're related, but they're not synonymous. Amen. <laughs> There's a distinct difference between being and doing. The ideal is you be and do. It's that you be both, but they're they're two different things. Being is what you are. Doing is how you express what you are. And it's possible for people who aren't born again to try and act like they are. <laughs> now I come from a church background where people are always trying to do that. They're trying to act like Christians, but they really they couldn't do it. So they, they said, well, I made a mistake, or they say something like, well, we're not all perfect, like that's a revelation. B. See, we become new creatures in Christ, new creation. So you're not the same as you were. If you're in Christ, you're not the, there's a, some sense in which you're not the same as you were. You're new. You're a new creation. Well, the scripture says in Ephesians 2.10, we're God's workmanship. Like this house, built over 100 by 125 years ago, there were certain kind of artisans that were brought in to build this house. You notice some of the fireplaces and things like that? That was a workmanship of some craftsman. You're the workmanship of God. Yes. <laughs> How about that? In Christ you are. Oh, I understand that even as just a normal, even as a person, as a human being, as to say, I understand that God created that too. Man, I'm sorry Darwin was wrong. You can't make a man out of an ape or, a, or some form of plasm. You, you can't do it. No one's been able to do it. It just takes an element of honesty. But see, you're, you're God's workmanship. Your body is God's workmanship. He formed it in the womb. Amen. Formed it, the bones in the womb, as the Proverbs put it. But in Christ, there's something about you that you can't see, but it's very real. Like you can't see your breath, but it's very, <laughs> it's very real. You can't see your soul, your spirit, but they're very real. And they're God made them. Yeah. And you're God's workmanship. And you've been created to do good works, Ephesians 2.10 says. That is, this is the kind of creation that can do what God says to do. Amen. Yeah. They can actually do it. Yeah. It's like a day of dawning. When it dawns on you, what God tells you to do, if you're in Christ, if what God tells you to do, you can do, that's like a major, major breakthrough. <laughs> Some people say, well, none of us do that. You know how we are, and so forth. So being, be ye. Being has to do with putting on the new man. That's what he's talking about. <clears throat> Now what are we to be? Followers of God. It's quite a, quite a challenge, huh? Yeah. Followers of God. Now, let me give this to you from some other versions, which I don't like. But Most of them say imitators. Most of the 48 versions that I say have say imitators. Be like God. Basic Bible English says, take him as your pattern, the New Jerusalem Bible says. Follow God's example. Uh, what example are you talking about? Creating the heavens and the earth? Well, obviously, we're obviously we're not talking about that. But how would you know we weren't talking about that? If he's talking about copying what God does, how then would you make, would, can you make hailstones fall that weigh 100 pounds each? God, did. can you cause fire to come out of the heaven, destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Huh? Can you do that? So obviously, it, does, it can't mean do what God does, although some versions do say that. One version says, copy God. <laughs> well, that's one thing to say that. It's quite something else to attempt it. 
become mimics of God. Try to be like him. That's a good news Bible. Give it a good old try. Try and be like God. Watch. Then here's the message Bible. Watch what God does and then you do it. <laughs> How dumb can you get? You know, I, most of what God does you can't see. Yes. The thing that's being spoken of here can't be separated from the requirement of a Savior and the price that was paid to purchase Amen. this. Mm -hmm. Amen. In other words, apart from what Christ has done, the thing that it, we're being enjoined to here, it's impossible to the flesh. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. And the Amplified Bible says, copy him and follow his example. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't like those at all. The word translated followers means, from a lexical or dictionary point of view, means imitator or follower. It's, it, it does mean that. In fact, the word, the Greek word is mimic. That's the word, mimic, from which we get mimicking. You mimic somebody. Copycat. Now this doesn't seem like an appropriate word to me. I don't, I don't like. I don't like what the lexicon and dictionary says, and I don't like what these versions say. It doesn't seem to project the idea here of following God to, to mimic in the English language means to impersonate or to perform or be like a play actor. But I, that can't mean that. It's here, I like the word follow. It's like God leaves a footprint and you put your foot in it. That's, that's sort of what it, what it means. Where there's evidence, where God, God has to tell you what he's done. But you, you'll never know what God's done unless he's told you what he's done. It's easier for people to say, oh, I see God did that. Well, maybe that's true, but you want to, you want to be careful how you say something like that. So whatever you see God do, of course you have to be right following along behind him. One prophet said that the, the path of the Lord is in the sea. Well, there's no footprints on the sea. I mean, you don't leave any footprints on the sea. In fact, if you're following a boat on the sea, you've got to follow close by because the wake finally disappears. So I like this follow. I, I just let, think that's the better mm -hmm. concept. It denotes that you're, you're close enough to God you can detect where God's going and you go that way. You put it put in his footsteps. Follow the footsteps Amen. of our father Abraham. The scripture once said you. So that's what he's talking about. It's another way of saying as the state in 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so are we in the world. That, that's, that's following God. If you do things different than God, that's not following God. There has to be some similarity between your priorities and the priorities of God. There's got to be some, some similarity. Now, I will... Modify that by saying his revealed priorities. See, to be to be more precise, what God has said: This is my purpose. This is what I'm doing. This had better be your purpose too. And if it's not, you will not please God. I don't care what you do. It may make the headlines, the philanthropic headlines, but if you're not doing what God's doing and headed the direction God's headed in. Then you're not, you can't please God. It's impossible. So he says to put on the new man, which after God is, is created after the likeness of God. So there, when you're born again, you receive a new nature. Your nature is to you what an engine is to the car. You receive something, a different kind of a, principle that directs you and motivates you. You're motivated differently than a person that's not in Christ. So you're moved by different 
It's a new creation. Amen. And when you do this, you, you are following God. Yes. See, that's, you are by putting on the new man, and you've got a nature in Christ. You've got a nature that's bent a certain direction, and as you follow that, that's following God. Yes, amen. That's what that is. Walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit. Now, Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18, that as we behold the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is what He's revealed of Himself and what can be perceived. That's the, just like the glory of the sun is what you, can, what you can see of it. The glory of God is what you can perceive or understand of, of God. And when you behold the glory of God and is seen in Christ, in the face of Christ Jesus, that glory is what changes you. Amen. That's especially stated in 2 Thessalonians, sorry, 2 Corinthians 3.18. That as we behold this glory, we are changed from glory, one stage of glory, to glory, to an increasing stage of glory, even as by the Spirit of our God. See, so as you're, you might say, studying God, and the only thing you know about God is what He reveals. So we're not talking about looking at the stars. <laughs> they aren't going to tell you anything about God's love or God's righteousness or God's mercy or God's long suffering. They aren't going to tell you squat about that. But the best thing your creation can tell you is God's big and God's powerful. That's about the extent of it. But as you are studying, you're a student of God, by looking at Christ, then the Holy Spirit, while you're looking or contemplating or considering, the Holy Spirit alters your person. So your priorities change, your focus changes, your desire changes. That's being followers of God. Why did he put some modifier on there? <laughs> Be followers of God as dear children. Or beloved children, or dearly loved children. Now God has children, but not all of them are dear. <laughs> Let me give you some examples of, of Israel. These were his people. He formed them. Here's something he said about them. Isaiah 1, 2. I've nourished and brought up children, and they've rebelled against me. I said, they were, there you are. They were, it's what he said now, it's what he said. These were his children. They weren't dear children. He didn't brag about them. He didn't say, this is my beloved child. They rebelled against me. Here's, some, here's something else. Commenting on the nation he created now. A sinful, ah, sinful nation, a people laid with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they've forsaken the Lord, they provoke the Holy One of Israel into anger, they've gone backward. <laughs> well, that's, <laughs> that's not dear children. There's some Christians, professing Christians, that fit right into that. No, oh, there are no. Every man's got to judge himself. It's not our job to be policemen and figure out who these people are. But it's everybody's business to find out, do I fit in that category like that? Have I been going backward? Just not a dear child. Once more, Jeremiah 3.21, they perverted their way and they've forgotten the Lord their God. All right, those are examples of children, but not dear children. That's the opposite of them. Dear, dear children are those who are responsive to the Lord. Their ways, their words, their deeds, they show God. They make, when people see what they do, they think about the Lord. People hear what they say, they, they think about the Lord. Those are dear, dear children. Their affections are set on things above. That is, they want what God's given. And they're looking to Jesus, as Hebrews 12, 1 says, they're looking for direction and for like a pole star. Jesus is in heaven. Everybody knows this. If you look to Jesus, you're, yeah. <laughs> and that's where you're going. Yeah. That's where Jesus is leading you. That's where the, the race of life 
correctly ends there. But you can't end there if you're not looking there. And if someone said, look to heaven, like, like what would, where would you look? He said, we look to Christ. And he tells you what, he, what about Christ now. He has all power in heaven and earth. He intercedes for God's people. He is sitting at God's right hand. He's governing everything. Principalities and powers have been made subject to him. He's interceding for the people. He's, see, he tells you so you're, to look to Jesus is in your mind. You look and consider him. And by so doing, you become dear children. Because now, uh, to state it rather vulgarly, God thinks a lot about a lot of Jesus. Amen. He's his well-beloved son. See, this is my beloved son. Oh, this, <laughs> this is the son I really placed all my hopes in right here. I've given everything I've got to my well beloved son and uh, now you folk on earth you hear him oh, yeah. remember, remember when uh, Jesus was transfigured and uh, Peter said hey, they saw Moses and Elijah they come back from the they come back from the world of the dead mm -hmm. Moses and Elijah I mean these men lived like a, over a thousand years before Jesus <laughs> When they came back, Luke says they talked with Jesus about the death that he should accomplish. And neither Moses nor Elijah said one word or one syllable about Christ dying. So wherever they came from, they picked up some additional information. And Peter was so impressed, let's build three tabernacles, three tents. Let's have three work, let's put it in today's language. We'll have three workshops here. Moses will hold one, Elijah will hold one, Jesus will hold one, they will have the best of both worlds. This voice come out of heaven and said, no, nah, no, nah. this is my beloved son, hear him. Amen. One tent. <laughs> you walk as dear children when you're focused on, on Christ, whether it's individually or collectively. Yes? I was considering this dear children uh, with a picture from the Old Covenant of Samuel when he was yeah. a boy mm -hmm. and, and how he was very quick in responding to yeah. Eli and what he desired. And I can imagine that Samuel was more beloved than Eli's natural children. Mm -hmm. He was as a dear child, but it's because um, Samuel was eager to receive his teaching. Mm -hmm. He was eager to receive the training yeah. and do the things that Eli was doing in the service of the Lord, and that's why he was beloved. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But again, yes. Uh, this, uh, it's astounding that this exhortation can be given to, to men to begin with. To, to be followers of God yeah. as dear children. Yeah. And this is a, this is a very high calling. Mm -hmm. But this, this is being like it, God sees us as dear children. Mm -hmm. It's right. more than just complying. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a vital connection here that God is recognizing. Mm -hmm. A dear child. What makes what distinguishes someone? as being a good or a profitable child mm -hmm. and a dear child. Mm -hmm. well, this is a this is an affectionate term here. Yeah. It goes beyond yeah. just being serviceable, just mm -hmm. keeping yeah. the rules, mm -hmm. just yeah. you know crossing your T's and dotting your I's to where you were maybe an approved of, yeah. in some sense. This has to do this followers of God. I get the picture here of of someone who every time that that they can see something of God, they love what they Amen. see. Amen. Mm -hmm. And they it, it's like they're they're drawn to that. That's right. They Amen. won't they won't go somewhere else. They won't depart mm -hmm. from it. They cleave to it. And the more they see, the more they continue to hold fast and yeah. to press in and their their desire grows because their knowledge of God is growing. But this is reciprocal also. Uh, I, you know, there are a lot of children in the world. There's some very goodly children in the world. And we could look at them and we could even admire those children. 
But those children aren't dear children to us mm -hmm. unless there's a connection of yeah, them. That's mm -hmm. right. Amen, Brother Tony. There's another way of saying this is what dear children do. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. You also remember that there were 12 disciples that were all yes. followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. But then there was the one beloved that yeah. leaned upon his breath. That's right. Yeah. It was the closest to That's him. right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, Brother Brock, you can see this is open for comments and discussion, so if you want to say anything, you go right ahead and speak up. We will only ask that it be profitable, you know. <laughs> yeah, dear children, Jesus had a lot of disciples, probably thousands of them. But of them all, there were 12. 12 disciples. What was the difference? Those 12 never left them. Ah, they never left him. The others did. They go home. Huh? Sometimes they go home because they didn't like what Jesus said, like in John 6. They just, oh, that's it. We, we're out of here. But the 12 never left. They were dear children. See, that's one of the traits of dear children. They don't leave. If they don't understand something, they stay and say, Lord, I want, I want, to, under, I want to understand that. I want to see that more clearly. See, that's a dear child. If God has something special to give and the person senses and say, here am I. <laughs> give it, give it to me, give it to me. Amen. See, if God has a special mission, he's going to send someone to Isaiah and say, here am I, send me. Send me, Lord. That's a dear, dear child. See, some people are content to stay in the background. Now, we're not going to judge anybody like this. That's the Lord's business. But I think I, I don't think that's a dear child. They want that's content to remain unknown. Some Pharisees believed on Jesus, but they didn't confess him because they knew they'd get ousted from the synagogue if they did. They, they, <laughs> I think a lot of Jesus, but don't be telling anybody about it. See, dear children aren't like that. They'll they'll die for Jesus. They will. You you tell them you're going to take their life. They'll lay down their life. Of course, that's what Jesus did for them as being a follower of God. And right, now I'm going to talk about a particular aspect of uh, being followers of God as dear children. And, there's that word again. <laughs> it says, this isn't point two. This is a continuation of point one. And, along with that, let me elaborate a little bit on this following. Walk in love, as Christ also loved us. Walk. We've talked about this word quite a bit. Very appropriate word, walk. The, the technical definition, yes, Sister Sydney? When you, um, when you said that you have to look to Christ to see the heavens, I thought of G Christ as the light, because when, um, when you don't have Christ, you can't. You everything's dark, so you won't be able to even yes. see heaven. Mm -hmm. And with Christ, you will see. You can see clearly. Yes, that's yeah. good. That's good, Sydney. Good. The word "walk." <coughs> here's a technical definition of "walk." To make one's way. That is your. You're negotiating through things to a certain destination. Or to make due use of opportunities. <laughs> like a road sign. You're reading the road sign, recognizing the surrounding. Or to progress. To progress. <laughs> of course, when you walk, you're making progress. You walk a step at a time, you're making some progress, it assumes you're going someplace, you're not, you can walk in circles. Israel in the wilderness, when they wandered, they walked in a circle. You see, <laughs> I imagine they come by and say, yeah, there's some, we've been here before. Same place, we just, well, some people live like that, you know, they have the same bad experiences over, over and over, oh, I shouldn't have done that, what did I do that again for, oh, I'm sorry. That's not walking, that's wandering. That's right. Walking is compared to wandering, see? Yeah. Particular destination. Amen. So it's, uh, in the scripture, the walk is on a highway. There's a certain 
There's a certain road the walking's done on. It's a highway. It's called a way of holiness, Isaiah 35, 8. And it's a, it's a way, it's a way. They're walking in a, a way is a road that we call a road. When you read in the scripture, they were in the way to such and such. The way, word way means it was a road. We call it a Route 44 or whatever. It was, it's a certain kind of a road. The road we're walking on is a way of holiness. That's what Isaiah called it. A way shall be there. A highway shall be. Highway meaning highway. You know, it's like an elevated road. And this walk is on that road. A person who's not on that road is, isn't, by scriptural definition, walking. Walking on that road. It's a, note, it's, a, it's a way, Hebrews 10, 20 says, it's a way, highway that's been opened up. Christ has opened up a new and a living way. That's how the scripture puts it. So it's a, it's a new road that leads to heaven that wasn't there before. Yeah. Amen. And it's a, it's a way, it's a pleasant way to walk on, quite frankly. Particularly if you come across some other citizens walking on it. Walking on the way. That's a walk. We're talking about walk now. Walk is a particular air environment you're walking in, which is called the way of holiness. And you're progressing, making toward a city that hath foundations whose builder and maker is God. Amen. Or you're walking toward a country, a heavenly country, a better country that is a heavenly country. You're, you're headed now, if you ask some people, some good old Americans, where are you going? Now, some people say, what do you mean? I'm going home from work. I'm going to the Walmart. That's where I'm going. That takes some people, this is the extent of how they think. But you should have stretched people's minds. I said, no, 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 no. I mean, which way are you going so that when you leave the world, you go to the right place. Yeah, yeah. One brother used to say when he was on elevators, he'd push the button for the people, you know, he'd say, are you going up and down, up or down? And say, up, he said, what about when you die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a way. That's right. Amen. Amen. There's a way that leads to heaven Amen. and a way that leads to God. And no walk is legitimate that's not on that way. Yeah. There's no progress made in any sense. Every other kind of walk is digressing and going backward. So this is the most appropriate word for, for living, how you're living. Those who walk this way are making progress. Now in a great falling away, the scriptures say there's a, a great falling away shall come. We think it, is, it has, it's arrived. Great falling away. And the great falling away professed believers cannot be described as progressing. Or shall we say growing. Or moving forward. You had asked the average Christian, are you growing in Christ? Unless they have some degree of understanding they won't know what you're talking about. Well you say, well I'm I'm up to going to church twice a month now, is it? I mean that's how they kinda of how they think. That's not what this is thinking. This walking is assuming a growing posture. Given this is a very deliberate walk and it's a very purposeful walk. Amen. You're not just aimless like you've already talked about this wandering. But this this is a, a, in a, a matter of you know you know where you're going. If you ever watch somebody, if, if they if they walk deliberate, they walk differently than someone who That's just right. is wandering right. around. Amen. How does scripture speak about walking in the steps of our father Abraham? They were steps of faith. Yes. He was walking toward where God wanted him to go. Why does scripture speak about walking in newness of life? That's, that's, that's the same, yeah. same thing. Or walk in the spirit. There it is again. 
God has ordained good works that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2.10 Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Don't be ignorant in your dealings with other people who aren't Christians. Be wise about it. Walk in the truth, John said. Walk in the truth. See, that shows that where, that where you walk is as important as the walk itself. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Now he says, walk in love. <laughs> now some people are perpetually grumpy. You know, that's just, just what they are. Like a Tom bomb ready to go off at any time. <laughs> They hurt everybody. Wherever they are, they say something hurts somebody. That's just the way they are. Walk in love. All right, now the emphasis is being placed on the love God's people have for one another. Amen. All right. I'm not sure in myself how you would describe the love we have toward, say, our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. But it's a different... It's a different kind of love. It's not the same kind of love you, where you love God's people. It's just a different kind of love. When you talk about loving the, like the people of the world or unsaved people, so forth, what it means is you, you, you are unwilling to do harm to them. You are ready to do good to them, do good to all men. You're ready to do good to them. When we talk about uh, brotherly, love, brotherly love, now that's, it ranks higher. Paul says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Yeah. She well, I don't want to feed him. Feed him anyway. Right. If your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him water, give him to drink. You're, we're talking about your enemy now, the one that's out to hurt you. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that or not. Yes, you can. God's given you, God's given you a nature that can do this. Jesus didn't. It. Jesus did it. God shows mercy on the just and the unjust. He sends rain on the fields of the sinners as well as the fields of the saints. He causes the sun to shine on the ungodly and the godly. See, but He gives the godly more, and you should too. There's a word uh, that Jehu said to. Jehoshaphat it is a very interesting question Jehoshaphat had made an alliance with the wrong king and here's what he said found in 2 Chronicles 19.2 very telling statement he says shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Ooh, ooh, that's, <laughs> I want to know what that means. Yeah. I don't want wrath coming down. No. Now here he's talking about like making an alliance with them, what the scripture call an unequal yoke. Mm -hmm. A jackass hooked up with an ox. <laughs> it's, an, it's an unequal. Yeah. One stubborn one. See? Yeah. So when it comes to loving the, the world, it's, it's discreetly, correctly. It's not preferential love. It's not your dear to my heart love. It's not that kind of love. When it comes to love of the saints, now here's something you can you get divine help on. Here's what the scripture says to the Thessalonians. What is touching brotherly love? Ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. See here? Ah, oh, now this is, the, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. When you walk in love, this is the kind of thing that happens. As you're walking in the highway of holiness, see, as your manner of life pleases the Lord, you, you have priorities that honor Him, you inconvenience yourself for God, you're, you're willing to put your own desires to the, into the background to please God, then God will teach you to love the brethren. To love His people like He loves them. He gives His people things He just doesn't give everybody. He gives them access to Himself. He doesn't give that to everybody. 
Some people's prayers hit the, hit the sky and come back down. They don't break through because God doesn't hear them. But now it's saints. That's, uh, that's another matter. This is never said of loving our enemies. Now God will teach you a lot to love your enemies. Maybe there's a sense in which he does, but that he doesn't make a point of it. <laughs> he doesn't make a point of it in the scriptures. The love of the brethren is a, is a distinctive mark that tells you something. Jesus said, By this shall all men know you're my disciples, that you have loved one for another. All right, you see, that's how they can tell. These are Jesus' disciples. They love one another. Some of the worst fights and arguments I have ever been involved in have been in church and with church people. That's not a mark of love. And then John adds, by this we know we passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. So that becomes a sign, huh? I'm not dead toward God anymore. I'm alive toward God. How do I know that I'm alive toward God? Because I love and have a preference for and a desire for the people he desires. Amen. Well, see, you must ask yourself the question, is this, uh, am I walking in love? Having this kind of concern for the people of God? You say, well, there's nothing in the Bible says we have to go to church all the time. Nothing in the Bible says we have to spend a lot of time there. But what does your heart tell you? When you consider God, and you consider there are some people that God has special interest in, He set a mediator up for them, He set an intercessor up for them, He's given them the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's promised to answer their prayers. He tells them, you can come to me whenever you want and find grace to help in the time of need. For you not to have preference for that kind of people, well, you ought to be scared. Walk in love. Well, put it more specific. As Christ also hath loved us. There, okay, we'll just spell it out. Amen. Jesus told his disciples, he said, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you. Yeah. That kind of love. Sometimes Jesus would walk further, stay up late at night to, just to be with his disciples and communicate with them. The demonstration of this love is unquestionable. However, Jesus didn't talk a lot about his love for his people. It's kind of interesting. He didn't talk a lot about it. Just mentioned it a couple times, that's all. Why? Because there's something he demonstrated. He didn't just talk about it, he demonstrated it. Paul said, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of by faith of the Son of God who loved me and yeah. it's what we call a coordinating conjunction. It ties two things together yeah. and gave himself for me. Now, whenever you read about the love of Christ, it's always connected with his death. Yeah. Amen. Very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's never just, mm -hmm. I like you a lot. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, not, <laughs> it's not like that at all. That's the standard now. John, when he's on the Isle of Patmos, and revelation was given to him there, he saw the glorified Christ, and he said it was him that loved us and washed us from our sins. See, there it is, tied together again. He loved us and washed us. So when you talk about the love of Christ, you, you've got to bring in this sacrificial death this has got to be brought into the picture because that's a supreme demonstration of his love Amen. now you love one another like that mm -hmm. what does that mean you sacrifice for your brethren mm -hmm. you prefer your brethren above yourself mm -hmm. in honor preferring one another see the scriptures yeah. tell us to do this we ought to think more highly of our brethren than we do of ourselves. See, that's, he yes. tells us, and Jesus lived this out. Jesus did this. As Christ loved us, 
then he comes down to this death again. His love for us is associated with Christ's death. In fact, God's love is associated with Christ. Yes, amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. See, he loved, and loved us and sent his son into the world. See, so it's, it's always connected with Christ coming into the world. It's never just like God loves you because of you and it's down between you and God. It's, it's never that way. And loving, walking in love's not that way. It's not just working in preference to one another because we like one another and we enjoy being around one another, even though we do. Even though we do. It's because of Christ. Amen. He's what knits us together. Amen. Now he has and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. This is the kind of love now we're to walk in. Not self-serving love, uh -huh. self-denying love. Yes. Galatians 1, 4 said, He hath given himself for us. That is, he forfeited his personal advantages, which were <laughs> very significant, yes. for us. Ephesians 5, 5.25 says, He loved the church and gave himself for it. That was involved in Jesus giving himself. The fact that he he knew that to advantage the church he had to forfeit some personal advantage. That's how far man had fallen and plummeted and he had to give something up. Now, what, like, what did he forfeit? Did Jesus actually forfeit something to love us? Well, let's, let's see whether he did or not. He forfeited equality with the Father. That's right. Philippians 2.6 Does that mean he ceased to be God? No. It means he ceased to take advantage of being God. Uh -huh. Being God is like a sword. Mm -hmm. Forfeiting that equality was like sheathing the sword. He knew that to overcome the devil it wouldn't work if he overcame the devil as God. <laughs> because God has no, God has no trouble with the devil. Right. He could just, and that's it. Yeah. So he forfeited. He he agreed mm -hmm. to end the world without any kind of rational aptitude. Mm -hmm. When Jesus came into the world, he came in as it couldn't think, couldn't talk, couldn't work, couldn't do anything. Totally reliant on the care of Joseph and Mary. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite a plummet, brethren. Yeah. From where he was, in the beginning was God, the Word is with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and oh, that's a long way from that. Yeah, what did that? That was love that did that. Amen. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us unto himself, or he gave himself a ransom to be testified in due time. See, that's... He gave himself, I mean, he put himself on the altar of sacrifice. He said, I'm willing to be totally dependent upon God when I come into the world. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'll live by faith just like they live. Yeah. I, I consent to enter where I got to pray to get something from my father. I had to pray. He, he didn't pray when he's in heaven. He forfeited that Amen. when he came to earth. And he consented to be humble himself, willingly take a lower seat. He knew God would exalt him again in due time, but for, for a season he was humbled, humbled himself. Philippians 2.8 he, he became obedient. We're talking about him that was in the beginning God. I mean, you would never say of God, he's obedient. <laughs> he's the one you're obedient to. He, God isn't obedient. And before Jesus came into the world, he wasn't obedient. But he consented to. That's the love we're talking about. This is the kind of love. He became obedient. Unto death. Unto death he became obedient. He had to submit to the end of the world in a restrictive body. He'd never been in a body. Yeah. 
before. He said, the body has not prepared me. See, he entered a body. Yeah. Amen. It's very humbling. Why? Because that's what his love moved him to do, see. He was put in a position where he had to have faith, he had to pray. He had, it was said of Jesus, he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. How's that for humility? <laughs> How's that for humility? He had to be put in a position to have faith. He had to be subject to Joseph and Mary. That's what it says, he was subject to them. <laughs> this is in the beginning God. This is that person. That's right. Subject to them. He was omnipotent, had to submit to being straightened or like held in a straitjacket. He said in Luke 12 50, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened, held in, till it be accomplished? He had to endure the rejection of men and take it. Yeah, that's not how God does. Men reject him, he just pours out judgment on him, he eliminates him. And he couldn't do that. Jesus couldn't destroy the people that were against him. Yeah. He said, I didn't come to destroy men's lives. That's he, right. he, he could have, I assume, come to destroy men's lives, but that's not why I come. I come to save men's lives. Yeah. See? Yeah. What I'm saying is that was a humbling. It was coming down. He had to be smitten by men. His visage, face was marred more than any of the sons of men. He had to submit to that. He had to uh, have feeling of hunger. Yeah. He said that when he saw the fig tree, he said he was hungry. Yeah. He submitted to thirst mm -hmm. on the cross. He said, I thirst. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly an attribute of God. He had to experience weariness. Remember when he saw that woman at the well? He sat on the well because he, Scripture says he was weary. See? Yeah. I'm showing you how he, how he offered himself. See? by submitting to do all of this. He had to submit to the sword of God, which Zechariah would say would be awakened against his own anointed. He had to submit to be smitten by God. His love moved him to do this. He had to endure being forsaken by God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to experience death. This is he who is the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And for the life, experience death. Yeah. See this? And he had to wait in the abode of the dead till God raised him from the dead. All right, now that's... That's like offered himself. Yeah. He gave his life to God to do whatever God required. What I just told you is what God required. An offering. He gave himself an offering. There's no part of his being that wasn't offered to God, presented to God. An offering. See, before Jesus, all other offerings were unsatisfactory. There were thousands, thousands probably millions of offerings given to God before Jesus, but none of them were satisfactory to God. They didn't accomplish what God wanted accomplished. David said, Psalm 51, 16, Thou hast not desired, thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. Even though God commanded the burnt offerings, they were to teach men, not provide for men. <laughs> There's a difference. In those offers, all those thousands and thousands of offerings that were offered, they were teaching men that before they could have life, someone had to forfeit their life. God offered himself. Jesus offered himself without spot. Now most of the time, being without spot would be accepted by God, right? That's what you normally would think of being without spot. This would be approved to God. But for Jesus, without spot meant die. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. See how different it was? Yeah. Yeah. Why? He offered. Mm -hmm. He submitted to that arrangement. 
Jesus was not offered to me. He wasn't offered to you. He was offered to God. Amen. By himself. The scripture makes the point. He offered himself. Which is quite a feat. Book of Hebrews, and I give you the reference, is refer to Christ's offering. One. It was once. He offered once. He made one offering. Men had made thousands of offerings. And none of them took away so much as one sin. Jesus had one offering, and it took all sin away. <laughs> one offering, that's all, took everything away. An offering and a sacrifice to God. The word sacrifice technically means that it's the, the solemn infliction of death upon a living creature. To sacrifice something, you offered grain, but you sacrificed animals. Yeah. took the life of it when the iniquity of us all was laid on Christ as Isaiah said Isaiah 53 and when he was made to be sin for us as 2 Corinthians 5 21 says and when he bore our sins in his body on the tree as 1 Peter 2 24 says that's when the sacrifice was made Amen. and when his life left his body the sins of the world left God's presence <laughs> that's a sacrifice to God and that sacrifice was for a sweet smelling savor like perfume in other words the fact that Jesus himself was spotless and willing to lay down his life and do what he commanded he was commanded to do made the offering and sacrifice pleasant to God not because God enjoyed seeing his son die it's not that he enjoyed seeing what would come from yes, amen. Amen. when he shall make a soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed <laughs> he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand yes, amen. now God said I want to give everything son over into your hands Bring the children home. Amen. See? There was a sweet smell and savor unto God. Now that's how we're to love one another. See, we're to love one another just in that same manner. Mm -hmm. By laying down our lives. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, John said. We, <laughs> we ought to do that. Why? Because, like, what are you going to lose? You mean to tell me God can't compensate for you doing without some of your preferences? God will give you much more than you had before. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be much more satisfied than you were before. Amen. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Amen. They will say, well, it's so demanding. It's so long. I, mean, I don't like to be there. You know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what they mean is we don't want to lay down our lives for the brethren. Yeah. They, well, yeah, but you got to remember, Christ laid down his life for you, Amen. and that's the standard. I think I'll close there, but it's such a marvelous text, isn't it? Amen. I like that this is there also that Christ laid his life down for us, but it was to God. That's right. right. And so in order to lay our lives down yeah. for the brethren, it is for the brethren's sake, but we are lay our lives down and sacrifice to God. Amen. 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 Yes, this is awesome. Do you, um, we're laboring the point of being followers, followers, of, of God. I was um, in my mind trying to think of an example in scripture where we see it lived out in the earth and, and of course it, my thoughts went to the disciples following Christ. They were with him. In fact that was, that was a requirement if you will for being an apostle right. that you were with him from the very beginning yeah. until the very end yeah. of his life in the earth. And so this is, this is our example if you will Amen. of following God mm -hmm. we we follow him because there's something to obtain we Amen. have we have things to get from him that he desires to give mm -hmm. to us just as the apostles <laughs> followed after Christ because they knew mm -hmm. that he had the words of life amen, mm -hmm. amen. yes sister um, also this laying down of our of our lives it is also to 
accomplish something. It's not just to lay down our lives. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus didn't just lay down his yeah. life. Yeah. It was what he was going to accomplish from this. So when we lay down our lives for the brethren, there's an accomplishment that comes from this. Mm -hmm. It's going to help them in attaining life as well. Amen. Mm -hmm. Tony, you're going to say something? Mm -hmm. Two things I was I was considering. I like the analogy you made with uh, the Israelites. They weren't really walking. Yeah. They were wandering. And, wandering. That's right. and without without God being involved, that's all you're doing is just Amen. wandering. You can't really walk unless you're in Christ Jesus. So Amen. I would see the world as just wandering. That's why you've made that yeah. reverence. You keep making the same old, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then something else. Now this, uh, this sweet smelling savor, this mm -hmm. sacrifice. Now this is an acceptable yeah. sacrifice Amen. to God. Mm -hmm. You see that now he can receive mm -hmm. this kind of sacrifice. Yes, he can. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. amen. It pleases God. Yes, amen. amen. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very thankful for this testimony that um about this about loving the brother. And you know, he gave Noah a rainbow in the sky. Yeah. He could see it. He and he could yeah. reason on it. Now you know whether or not you love the brother. And nobody has to tell you know. And if you do, this is your token for good. Yeah. Because you know Yet you love God because you you love the brother. Amen. And I, I know we know this, but let's say it once again. The brethren, there that's everyone that's in Christ Jesus. It doesn't just mean our brethren. You know? <laughs> Your brethren is a whole household of faith. The better part of it, the better part is in the glory already. Spirits of just men made, made perfect. I forgot about that sectarian brother. Though. That's right. <laughs> I've been here so long now. <laughs> you know, one thing about the disciples, Melissa brought up the disciples. They didn't just follow Jesus one by one on Monday, Peter, you know, on Tuesday, John, and so on. They followed him as a group. That's right. Right? And that was the strength. Being together was the strength. That's how we follow together, see? Yes. Amen. As a body, you'll, we'll meet someone, we've met people from other countries, Pakistan, Kenya, and India. We met them personally, and immediately there was a, there was a bond. Yeah. Not because there was any physical similarities. <laughs> Sometimes we could hardly understand what they said. But we, there was this bond. Yes, amen. We were together following uh -huh. yes. Christ. Well, you know the, the eleven were in the boat, and they watched Peter walk on yes. the water. They watched that whole thing, you know. Yes. Now sometimes we may have encountered one of the brethren going through a trial. We didn't have to go through it. They went through it. Yeah. We, but, but see, we could, we can testify. We, we witnessed mm -hmm. that. We learned something. Yeah, from amen. That. Yeah. yeah, amen. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Peter's the only man in the world that ever walked on water beside Jesus. Yeah, right. Said he walked on the water to go to Jesus. How far he got, he didn't get all the way. We know, but he did. Uh -huh. And the disciples didn't say, good job, boy, you made it there 20, 30 feet. That's really... I mean, if you sink, it doesn't... <laughs> the walking doesn't count. Uh -huh. All right? I mean, people should understand as if... If you, if you fall off into sin after you've been in Christ 20, 30, 40 years, you just wasted 20, 30, 40 years. They don't mean anything. Unless you recover. Then you got to start over. <laughs> yeah. Well, great truths to be, to be seen here in there. Yes. Yes, Brother Ricky. Yeah, why not? Robin mentioned uh, the Apostle John. As one of the particular ones that John, that Jesus loved, you know, when he brought, when Jesus called his disciples into the ministry, remember he called John and his brother. They were on the boat fishing, yeah. and they weren't, they weren't able to catch anything. Yeah. So remember, Jesus told them to cast their net yeah. on the other side of the boat. Three years later, after Jesus had been raised from the dead, he uses that familiarity yes, right. <laughs> to disclose himself to his disciples. Here they are out fishing. fishing and they're not catching anything and they hear this stranger from the coastline say, throw your net on the other side. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Now if you're dull, you'll forget what Jesus did three years ago. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. John was the first one that recognized it's the Lord. It's mm -hmm. the Lord. But see, that's how God directs you is 
is as you're able to understand the ways of the Lord, you are more easily inclined to follow the Lord. Amen. And so John, John could, John wasn't dull. He he could think of that experience and say, "This is the Lord," mm -hmm. and, and that's part of what makes a dear child. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. You might be there. Walk as dear children could be viewed as a commandment or a requirement, but it could be viewed also as an invitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Invitation, amen. Amen, that I can come closer amen. than where I am now. I like that. that. I, mm -hmm. I don't have amen. to be average. I know that there's a common perception that God loves everyone the same, and people even say, you know, we're all on the same level, there's no difference between us, which is very counterproductive, mm -hmm. yeah. because I, in, a, in a house, Paul said, in a great house are all manner of vessels. Mm -hmm. And so walk as dear children means you don't have to be a wooden vessel. Mm -hmm. Very you can, good. You can be used, you can come close mm -hmm. and be used for special purposes and be used above average. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Come sure. unto me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I like that invitation. <laughs> Amen. Amen. When we think of dear children, we think of, of course, Isaac. <laughs> That's right. And Jacob. Yeah. And Joseph. But yes. There also, Amen. Amen. There was also Ishmael, Esau, and Reuben. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. It's the like other examples. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Brother Paul. Yeah. Sharing. I'm trying sharing the, the view of the judgment. He said that whatever, whatever you have done to least of these, you have done to me. This preference of the love of the breath of the brethren is actually our testimony of our preference for our love of God. It's, Very uh, good. Mm -hmm. It's not just a that we love the brethren. We do love the brethren. I, mean, uh, I don't want to be inaccurate in saying what I'm trying to say. But uh, it's it's more of a our our evidence, our faith saying we do love God. This that's is right. where mm -hmm. our focus is at. Amen. That's why we love the people. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Anyone else? All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Are there any Father? We're thankful that you have spoken as you have on this subject and have given us some signs and indicators of how we're to love one another. Help us never to be satisfied with a mediocre acquaintance with your people or a casual view of them, but that our love for them might be akin to Christ's love for us, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.